My name's Duncan, and we're absolutely delighted to be bringing this course to you for FP&A professionals on three-statement modeling. If you've ever struggled with three-statement models, you are certainly not alone. It can be one of the most challenging things to do in financial modeling. And it can be incredibly frustrating when you link together the financial statements, only to realize that the statements just don't balance. In fact, this can be even more challenging for FP&A professionals who are often dealing with monthly models with a large number of columns and a lot of complexity, so a large number of rows as well. So with that in mind, we have designed this course to make sure that you deeply understand the basics of the financial statements and you're able to link and balance them every time. So we'll start by quickly reviewing the time period and the main purpose of each financial statement, but then very quickly get into an understanding of the relationship between the cash flow statement and the balance sheet. So understanding the relationship between these two statements is absolutely critical for getting models to balance. And what we've even done is designed a procedure for you so that you can follow through the procedure sequentially and get the balance sheet to balance every single time. We're also going to show you our recommended structure for financial models, where we always use supporting schedules to do all of the complex calculations, leaving only links for the financial statements. And when we're going through these supporting schedules, we're going to show you some common structures that get used in financial modeling, like corkscrews. And finally, we're going to discuss the role of a revolver or a line of credit in financial models and show you how it can be used as a lender of last resort and how we're going to be able to always calculate when it is needed. So that might sound like a lot, but don't worry. We're going to be there with you every step of the way. You're going to come out of this course with a very deep understanding of the financial statements, knowing how to get your models balanced. So let's quickly discuss the learning objectives for this course. First of all, for each financial statement, we want to be able to identify the time period and understand the main purpose of the statement. Now, there is a very important relationship between the cash flow statement and the balance sheet. We need to be able to explain this relationship and make sure that we understand it. Now, we're going to recommend a procedure that can be used to balance even the most complex FP&A models. And the idea is that we would bring the model back to balance as each set of line items gets added. We're also going to discuss the structure and the purpose of both the supporting schedules and the financial statements. We want to be able to compare them and understand exactly how they're different. Now, there are some common structures that get used in financial modeling, and one example would be a corkscrew. We want to understand what these are to know exactly when we should be using them. And finally, we need to be able to explain the role of a revolver or a line of credit in a financial model and to be able to calculate exactly when it is needed. Now, for each one of the financial statements, it's critical that we understand two things. Number one, we want to understand the main purpose of that statement, but we also need to know the time period that that statement covers. So let's bring up here a set of financial statements, and we want to think about each one of these statements as being able to tell us something different about the financial health of the company in question. So what can the income statement tell us about the company's health? Well, it can give us a meaningful measure of profitability for the company. Now, it's great to understand whether or not the company is profitable, but a thorough health check would involve more than just one check. So what we can do next is look to the cash flow statement, and there we can get a sense of how well or how efficiently the company is managing its cash flow. And finally, we can look to the company's balance sheet, and there we'll be able to see a list of all the assets, we'll be able to see their value, and understand how they're financed, which will give us some insight into the company's capital structure. So now we have a sense of the main purpose of each one of these three statements, but what about the time period that they cover? Well, for the income statement and the cash flow statement, they both will show results over a period of time. For example, they may show results for the most recent quarter or the most recent fiscal year. But the balance sheet is different. The balance sheet will show values as of a moment in time, 
and specifically, it will show the values as of the end of the period. Now that we understand the main purpose of each statement and the time period that each one of them covers, let's dig deeper into the structure of each one of these three statements. Now, as we just discussed, the income statement obviously can measure profitability for a company over a period of time. And let's bring in here an example of an income statement. Now, one of the first things that people may look at on an income statement is commonly referred to as the top line, meaning the revenue right at the top of the income statement. Now, the revenue is recorded on the income statement based on accrual accounting, which basically means that all the revenue shown for year one was actually earned in year one. Next, the income statement will show us a number of line items for expenses. Now, each one of these expenses has been matched to the accrued revenue that's above it. So what do we mean by this? Well, essentially, once we accrue revenue to a certain period based on when it has been earned, we then match all of the associated expenses with that revenue into the same period. By accruing the revenue into the correct period and then matching the associated expenses, we end up with a meaningful measure of profitability or loss for the company. Now we've simplified things here with this diagram showing profit or loss at the bottom with the net income, which is commonly referred to as the bottom line. But as you probably know, we can actually check for profitability at many places on an income statement. Just reading through the labels from top to bottom, we could check the company's gross profit, EBITDA, EBIT, earnings before taxes or EBT, or the bottom line or net income. Each one of these line items will give us insight into the company's profitability, remembering that we're checking profitability over a period of time. And here we're looking at the period of time for year one, year two, and year three. So as we discussed, the cash flow statement measures cash management over a period of time. And let's bring in an example here of a cash flow statement. A cash flow statement is typically broken up into three sections, and the first section is known as the operating section, showing the cash from the company's operations. Now, you'll notice that this section starts with net income, and we know from our previous discussion that net income was accrued on the income statement, but what we want here is a reflection of the cash from operations. So we're adding back the non-cash items like deferred taxes and depreciation, and this is unwinding the accrual process to get us to a measurement of the company's cash from operations. The next section we would see on the cash flow statement is cash from investing. And it's typical to see this section as being negative cash flows as the company is investing in its property, plant, and equipment. And finally, here we see the third section of the cash flow statement, which is cash from financing. Here we're seeing the cash inflows or outflows due to changes in the company's capital structure, like changes in debt or changes in equity. We're also seeing a line for dividends where there's cash outflows getting paid to shareholders in the form of dividends. And finally, just to summarize these three main sections of a cash flow statement, we have this summary at the bottom, which we're showing here. So the summary section always shows the cash balance at the beginning of the year, the changes which occurred through the period, which we're showing here as an increase or decrease, and then finally the cash balance at the end of the year or the end of the period. The other thing that you probably know about cash flow statements is that cash outflows are always shown as negative numbers and cash inflows are always shown as positive numbers. So just like the income statement, we are seeing results here over a period of time. So we're able to assess the company's cash management over year one, year two, and year three. So let's take a look at the balance sheet now, which obviously shows the company's assets and the capital structure, but it's showing these things as of one moment in time. 
So let's bring in now an example of a balance sheet. And obviously at the top of a balance sheet, it would have listed the company's assets, followed by its liabilities, and finally, the company's equity. Now you may have heard this before, but you can think of the company's assets as what the company owns. The liabilities are what the company owes, and the equity is of course the remainder or what's left over. So we can obviously see under assets that property, plant, and equipment is by far the largest asset for this particular company. And we can see roughly how that was financed because if we look in liabilities, we can see a revolving line of credit or a revolving credit line and long-term debt. In the equity section, we can see that there's just one class of shareholder in common equity. Now, one of the most important parts of a balance sheet is down at the bottom, highlighted in this gold color, where we have a check. And what we're doing there simply is taking the total assets and subtracting the total liabilities and equity. In this course, we're really going to focus on the importance of that check. As aggravating as it can be when you do not have a balance in a balance sheet, you need to view it as a good thing. It is the financial model telling you that there's actually something wrong, which is incredibly helpful. So we always want to view an unbalanced balance sheet in a positive light because the model has alerted us to the fact that something's wrong, and then we need to go through and figure out what it is and correct it. Now it's important to have a discussion about the order of the financial statements. And let's just bring up the order that we've used in this course with the income statement, followed by the cash flow statement, and finally the balance sheet. Now you may know that companies have the flexibility to present the financial statements in any order. For example, if they're most proud of their assets, you may see them presenting the balance sheet first. Whereas if they wanted to really show off their profitability, you may see the income statement presented first. Now, when you're designing and building financial models, you do have the flexibility to deviate from the order that the company presented the statements in. So let's look at the order and why we've chosen it here. The bottom of the income statement, as you know, is the quote unquote bottom line, which is net income. Well, at the top of the cash flow statement is also net income. So by putting the statements in this order, we get a nice flow from the income statement over to the cash flow statement. Now at the bottom of the cash flow statement, you're going to find a summary. And inside that summary, often near the bottom, you're going to find the ending cash balance for the company. Well, if we transition that over to the balance sheet, the balance sheet also starts with a cash line. And as you probably know, on a balance sheet, you would always report ending balances. So the ending cash can flow nicely from the cash flow statement over to the top of the balance sheet. So by selecting this order, we have a nice flow from left to right. However, we have presented these statements in a horizontal fashion, just because they fit nicely onto the computer screen. But when we're actually building a financial model, we would always recommend vertical model building. That means that these would be stacked vertically with the income statement on top, followed by the cash flow statement and the balance sheet on the bottom. And that way we get a really nice top to bottom flow through these financial statements. By far the most important takeaway from this module and in fact from this course is to understand the relationship between the cash flow statement and the balance sheet. So now let's bring in some headings for the cash flow statement and the balance sheet. If we were to see a line item on the balance sheet for equity capital, well then we should also see a corresponding line item on the cash flow statement for equity issuance or buyback. So what this means is if there are any changes to the equity capital on the balance sheet, we should see the cash impact of those changes on the left through the equity issuance on the cash flow statement. Similarly, if we had a term loan on the balance sheet, then on the cash flow statement, we would see term loan issuance or repayment. The balance sheet had a line of credit. On the cash flow statement, we would see the line of credit issuance or repayment. So the three pairs that we've presented you with so far are relatively straightforward because the labels are so similar. But on the balance sheet, if we had property, plant, and equipment, then what would be the corresponding line items on the cash flow statement? 
Well, on the cash flow statement, there would actually be two line items, capital expenditure and depreciation. So let's think about how this could work. As the company invests in capital expenditure, that would make the value of the property, plant, and equipment increase. But the company's depreciation would then take away or subtract from the value of the property, plant, and equipment. You may see inventory listed as one of the company's assets on the balance sheet. Well, on the cash flow statement, there may be a corresponding line from the cash changes due to inventory. Similarly, on the balance sheet, you may have a line for accounts payable, and there would be a cash from accounts payable line on the cash flow statement, accounts receivable, and cash from accounts receivable. You may see retained earnings on the balance sheet. And what it matches with on the cash flow statement may not be as obvious. It would be net income and payment of dividends, where net income would increase retained earnings and the payment of dividends would detract from retained earnings. The balance sheet may also show a line for deferred tax, which would be an accumulation of the company's deferred tax over time. The cash flow statement would show the amount of deferred tax in that specific period. So the most important takeaway from this discussion is understanding these paired up sets of line items. For example, every time you see property, plant, and equipment on the balance sheet, you need to make sure that there are line items for capital expenditure and depreciation over on the cash flow statement. So let's continue this discussion here, again with the cash flow statement and the balance sheet. And we can bring up these line items here, which are identical to the ones on the last diagram. But one thing you may see on the cash flow statement, which may be different than what we just discussed, is you could see one line item labeled as cash from working capital items. This is actually quite common on cash flow statements and more common than breaking out line items individually for inventory, accounts receivable, and accounts payable. So if you see this one line item on a company's cash flow statement, you would need to understand that that needs to be paired up with all the working capital items on the balance sheet. In this case, we're talking about inventory, accounts payable, and accounts receivable. And finally, let's bring in these line items or paired line items below, which are identical to the last discussion. Now, it would be a great idea to commit this diagram to memory and also the previous diagram so that whenever you encounter these line items, you know exactly how they should be paired up on the cash flow statement and the balance sheet. A lot of the times when balance sheets do not balance, it could be because a line item is missing. For example, there may be a line item from cash from working capital items on the cash flow statement, but it could be that perhaps inventory is missing from the balance sheet. So you always need to have these pairs working together to make sure that everything's balanced. Now, as you can see, we have the Excel template open here and we can see the template name three statement model template. So if you didn't download that, just hop back to the last lesson, and give it a quick download and then we'll meet you back here. So you're probably going to find this first assignment pretty straightforward. All we want to do for this first step is fill out the income statement right here and fill in all of the gray cells for this particular statement. You've probably heard us say this before, but the keyboard is so much faster and more efficient than using the mouse. So try to use the keyboard for this entire assignment if you could. For example, if I wanted to start here and figure out the gross profit, I could put in an auto sum just like this by hitting Alt equals. That puts a sum in like that. I can hit enter. And then if I want to effectively copy it across, I can use the shift key to highlight across and then hit control R and it's copied or filled all the way to the right. So completing that row has earned us a checkbox over here. So see if you can get all of the checkboxes all the way down to net income. Good luck and we'll see you soon. Continue learning. Join CFI today.